Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Tender Comrade, starring Olivia de Havilland, June Dupre, and Dennis O'Keefe. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In today's titanic struggle for democracy and freedom, there are many different armies wearing many different uniforms. There are the embattled armies in the field and on the seas and in the air. There are the armies in the factories and on the farms. And there's another great and unsung army in America, the wives who have been left behind to keep the home fires burning. They are the spiritual comrades of the men in arms, tender, unforgettable comrades. And to them, our play tonight is dedicated. It's RKO's quite recent and delightful screen hit, Tender Comrade. Starred in our cast are the talented Olivia de Havilland, captivating June Dupre, and a young gentleman who's climbed to stardom I have personally followed with great interest, Dennis O'Keefe. In fact, Dennis started his screen career with me, playing a bit part in The Plainsman. We're told by psychologists that when our men come back from this war, they'll bring with them a whole new set of values. I'm inclined to doubt that. They'll have new values, yes, but not a whole new set. Many of the old values will prevail as strongly as ever, and one you can count on is a man's appreciation of a pretty face and an appealing soft complexion. And so if you are one of the tender comrades with a husband in the service... I think that husband will agree with me when I suggest that you keep steady company with Lux Toilet Soap. Now here's the first act of tonight's play, starring Tender Comrade. Starring Olivia de Havilland as Joe, June Dupre as Barbara, and Dennis O'Keefe as Chris. Teacher, Tender Comrade, wife. A fellow fair, true through life, heart whole and soul free, the august father gave to me. This story begins a couple of years ago in a small apartment in Los Angeles. An anxious, restless girl waits in a dark room. She's Mrs. Christopher Jones, called Joe. She keeps looking at the clock and then through the window to the black, silent street. With a heavy sigh, she slumps into a chair. Suddenly, there's a knock. She runs to the door and flings it open. Chris! Oh, Chris, Chris! Joe. Oh, gosh. Chris, I... I can't say anything. Oh, neither can I. I just want to hold you and kiss you. Oh, it's been so long. Yeah. Yeah. Big baby. Here. Handkerchief. Thanks. I'm home, Joe. Not much like our place in Shale City. Well, you are here. It's home. How are you, Joe? Fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. How's it feel to be working for a living? Oh, it helps, Chris. In lots of ways. A year ago, you never thought your wife would be making airplanes, did you? Sometimes it makes me mad, Joe. Sometimes it makes me kind of proud. Mostly proud, I guess. How long can you stay? Not long. Only till morning. 6.30. I guess we'll be shoving off overseas. Oh, Chris. Where? I don't know. Hey, come on, this is no funeral. Me, your husband, I'm home for the night. I want a hot bath and a cold drink and about 300 kisses. Now have the bath first, if you don't mind. 75 degrees and uh, make it snappy. Hey, hey, wake up. Hmm? Your train leaves in an hour and a half. Now, wake up. Okay. Hey, let go of me. Come on, kiss. Oh, all right. Mushy. Uh, how long have you been up? Since three. I couldn't sleep. Boy, oh, boy. Do you know what I'm going to do after this war is over? I'm going to concentrate on being a civilian. I'm going to sleep every morning until 10 o'clock, and I'm never... Hey, what are you looking at me like that for? Nothing. 
Except that of all the guys I could have married, how did I pick out the homeliest? Fine talk, fine talk, just fine. Hey, come on, we gotta get going. Good thing we hurried, Joe. There's the train. We still have two minutes. Oh, Chris, I'm scared. Oh, now, nothing's going to happen. Look, I'm one out of millions of G.I.s. Figure out the percentages. They're all in my favor. I know it. But holy mackerel, I'm sure going to miss you. Yeah, me too. But just think how it's going to be when I get back home again. I'll jump off the train and pick you up and kiss you a couple of hundred times and take you back to Shale City. You know, Shale City's got it all over Los Angeles. What else? Oh, not much more to tell, I guess. Except that I'll be crazier about you because I've been away from you longer. We'll go back to Shale City and get that little place on the edge of town. Yeah, you bet. And I'm going to build a barbecue and we can have the gang over and have a few drinks. And I'll barbecue the meat while you take care of the salad and stuff. Uh-huh. And then we can sleep on Sunday morning. Maybe all day. Boy. There's another thing we'll be able to have after this is over. What's that? We'll have ourselves a kid. And a big backyard with vegetables and a place for him to play. You know, it's a funny thing. I never thought I'd ever want any kids until I married you. Well, you weren't supposed to, you big love. Joe. Joe, I love you. The way I love you is like a fever that's all over me. Write me, baby. Will you write me whenever you can? Chris, I'll write you every day. And every minute, every second, I'll be sending you messages. And remember to take care of yourself. And don't pay any attention to those Australian girls. And come back to me, Chris. Come back to me. Give me a kiss. Joe. Joe, no matter how tough things are, no matter how bad they seem, all I have to do is think of you and I'll come through. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Chris. Goodbye. All morning I've been dying for lunchtime. Tonight is lunchtime as far as I'm concerned. Wait a minute. Here comes Joe. Joe! Hi. Hello, Hello. Joe. Well, look. What's the matter with me? And don't answer that. I'll ever learn, Joe, a 14 ton hangover. Hey, you should talk. Joe, your eyes are all swollen. Yeah. Chris got in last night. We had breakfast this morning. I saw him off and then I bawled. Joe, well, how is he? He's okay, Helen. Only he's leaving for overseas. It's funny, I don't even know which sea. Oh, you shouldn't have said that, Joe. That's talking about troop movement. Well, it ought to be safe here. Everybody but you has a husband in the service. Helen even has a son in the army. Doris, Doris White. Yes? What have you got on your finger? What? Just a wedding ring. Why, Doris, when did it happen? You little chump. I knew you'd go and pull a trick like that. Well, tell us about it. Well, there really isn't very much to tell. He got in town for an hour and... Well, it took him 45 minutes to propose, and then we went out and got married, and I took him to the train, just like you took Chris, I guess. Oh, gee, Doris. What's your new name? Dombrowski. You traded a name like White for Dombrowski? That guy must be terrific. What's his first name? Michael. I, I call him Mike. Say, I've got a wonderful idea. Why don't we... Hiya, Barbara. Oh, brother. Hiya. Don't mean to interrupt the coffee clatch. Good morning. Hello. What do you say, Barbara? How about that date? I told you before. When you're ready to talk Coconut Grove, I'll listen. Me, I can't get romantic over a bowl of chili beans. Okay, okay. I'll try again when you're rising, so bloodshot. Oh, go dye your hair and come back disguised as a young wolf. These senior citizens. Well, if you ask me, I think you're leading them on. On to what? The 60-cent blue plate special? Still, you do make dates, Barbara. Well, why not? Well, because you've got a husband in the Navy. That's why not. Listen to me. If you've had as much trouble with a man as I've had with Pete Thomas, no sense of responsibility, no nothing. He had enough sense of responsibility to enlist, didn't he? Oh, sure. He'd enlisted all right. Three years before Pearl Harbor. He fell for that girl in every port stuff. Only I'll bet for him it worked. Oh, Joe, you started to say you had an idea. Well, I was thinking, why don't we initiate the new bride into our union, War Widow's Local Number 37, and throw a party? Oh, oh Joe! Joe. Yeah. Well, except none of us has a room big enough to hold four people without using a shoehorn. Well, we could have it in my new place. That is, I'm hunting for a new one, just in case Mike gets a furlough. How much are you planning to pay? Well, I'm paying 20 now. I thought maybe for 35. You still have a rabbit hutch. You know, all of us together, we put out a lot of money for rent. What do you pay, Helen? 22.50. I pay 18. How about you, Barbara? 32.50. I like gaudy things. Let's see now. That's over $90. How do you like that? Why, but for that kind of dough, we could have a real house with a dining room and a living room and, and a bedroom apiece, maybe, and furnished. Well, it might work. 
But we're all such different people, and there might be a clash of personalities. We'd have to find some way of adjusting any disputes that might come up. Well, that should be simple. We'd take a vote. If anything comes up, we'll just call a meeting. Now, how about it? Okay? Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Barbara? Huh? We'll say aye. Aye. Unanimous. We'll start house hunting right after work. Well, here we are. A new home. And what a dump. Well, naturally, it'll take some brightening up. It's sort of messy. And but it's very nice. For Frankenstein's bath. Oh, a fireplace. Fireplace? I've seen more of two bigger holes. Well, my advice now is for all of us to get some sleep. We can go over everything in the morning. Oh, come on, kids. Let's look at the bedroom. Hey, break step when you get to that stairway. Looks very tired. Joel, can I come in? It's me, Doris. Sure, Doris. I'm just getting ready for bed. I, I was kind of lonesome. Yeah, I know. I know how I felt when I first got married. Oh, it doesn't seem like I'm married at all. I just kind of got a first mortgage on him. Tell me about him, Doris. Go on. Have you got a picture? Well, yes. It was taken quite a while ago. Let me see it. Here. Oh? Well, you see, he was just nine years old when it was taken. <laughs> Mike was an orphan, and that's the last picture his folks had taken. Oh. Where'd you meet him? On the streetcar. About six months ago. What did he say when he proposed? Oh, Joe. Well, how are you going to know you're married if you don't talk about it? Go on. It's fun. Well, we were in the pig and whistle, and... And he told me about his folks in the army, and then he got kind of red and uncomfortable, and he said, I don't feel so good. Let's go out and get some air. And I said, well, what's the matter? And he said, I don't know. I just haven't got any appetite. And I said, well, maybe you're in love or something. And he said, well, maybe I am. And I said, well, there's a cure for that. You could tell her all about it and maybe get married. And he said, well, I don't know whether she'd have me or not. And I said, of course I will. <laughs> and then we just looked, and I said, oh, Mike, that's the most beautiful proposal a girl's ever had. And then he got that, you know, that kind of smug look that they get. And he said, gosh, Doris, I never thought I'd have the nerve to say it. Gee, aren't men fools? Yes, but aren't they sweet? Uh-huh. Is that a picture of Chris? Mm-hmm. I take it to bed with me. Pretty sappy, huh? Oh, no, no. Well, I, I feel better. i better go and leave you two alone, you and Chris. Good night, Doris. Sweet dreams. Good night, Joe. Yes, Chris. I'm lucky. At least I've got a picture of you. Such a nice picture. Did you hear us gabbing away just now? It's nice they're married, Doris and Mike. Remember about us, Chris, and how we decide to get married? I was in the backyard, sitting in the hammock, trying to dry my hair. Gosh, it was a nice day. Hi, babe. I'm all right. And don't call me babe. You know, um, I've been thinking. Think? And it seems to me that uh, you and I ought to get married. What did you say just then? I said that maybe we ought to get married. Well, if you haven't got the nerve of a government mule. Well, what's wrong? What's wrong? Everything's wrong. What about last night? Last night? You just got the wrong girl, that's all. Me, I'm Joe Flanagan, remember? And last night, you just spent all your time with Linda Randall, that's all. I danced three times with Linda. And at the Henderson's, Henderson's it was Mady Sanders, and at the Halloween party, well, it was... You must be nuts. I hardly know Mady Sanders. You spent all your time dancing and flirting with other girls, and then when you feel your years creeping over you, you come back to good old Joe. What do you mean, years creeping over me? And as for coming back to you, I never left. I'm just trying to tell you that I... Uh... I know what you're trying to tell me. After wolfing around every girl in town... I didn't do any wolfing. You did so. What happened? The others turned you down? Doggone it, Joe. I never proposed to anybody but you. A fine proposal. Making everybody miserable all the time. Well, doggone it, Joe. I haven't made anybody miserable. You have, too. All right, who? Me, you darn fool. Now, look. I didn't come over here to get into a fight. Ever since we were kids, I guess I've been in love with you. And so it seemed like a nice sunny morning, and I thought to myself, I guess I'll drop by Joe's house and ask you to marry me, and that's all there is to it. Well, why didn't you tell me before? Because hmm. I didn't know, I guess. 
No what? But I was in love with you. Oh, that's just fine and dandy. So you've been stringing me along all these years. I haven't been stringing anybody along. Well, then tell me this, Mr. Wolf. What have you been hanging around all these years for if you didn't know? Because I like to hang around. I liked you and I like... Oh, you wanted me to be a sister to you, huh? Pal, lead you around by the hand and keep your nose dry so you go chasing around... Oh, for the love of Pete, Joe, will you stop picking on me? Gee, I never saw a girl so hard to propose to as you are. Uh Aha! So... I thought you'd never propose to any other girl before. I never did. Then how'd you know you never saw a girl so hard to propose to? Oh, Joe, that's just the way you say something you don't mean. I don't know why we're having all this trouble. Because a girl likes to plan on things, that's why. For the tight-mouthed clam like you, she's never safe. She can't act like she's in love because she never knows how the guy really feels about her. She can't even get a kick out of it because the darn fool may not be in love with her at all. And she'd just be making an idiot out of herself in front of everybody. That's what makes me so darn sore, Chris Jones. You and your old secrets, and if you... Shut up. I'm sick of hearing you holler like that. Holy mackerel, what a crab you're going to be in five years. I am not. I said shut up. Okay. Now, there's only one question up between us, and you can answer it with one word. And this is the only time I'll ever ask it. Now say it one word and no more. Will you marry me? Yes. That's what I thought. (laughs) That's what you knew, you darn fool. That's what you've always known. That's what's always made me so darn sore. Oh, Joe, I think I've been loving you since the time I cut off your hair. Gee, was Mom sore. Yeah, so was I after the old man got through with me. (laughs) Guy seems good, doesn't it? Seems wonderful. Hey, what's the big idea? Hmm? You stop kissing me? Of course not. Hey, watch out the hammock. (laughs) Joe, for goodness sake. It's all right, Mom. He's going to marry me. (laughs) Yes, Chris. I get scared stiff every time I think how close we came to not getting married. Good night, Chris. Good night, darling. In just a minute, Mr. DeMille and our stars will return in Act Two of Tender Comrade. Lux girls, Lux girls, Lux girls. Why, Sally, what are you doing? Thinking out loud? (laughs) Why, yes, Mr. Kennedy, I guess I was. Thinking about Lux girls. You see them everywhere, you know. You bet I know. Those girls with the gorgeous complexions. Well, I went to the opening of a new picture the other night, Mr. Kennedy. I saw Barbara Stanwyck, Rita Hayworth, and that lovely new star, Lauren Bacall. Every one of them Lux girls. And every one of them with a really beautiful skin. That Lux soap certainly must have something. It certainly has, Mr. Kennedy. When you realize how many of the famous stars use it every single day, you know it's just got to be good. Well, Sally, we know it's as fine a soap as can be made. Yes, Lux soap has rich, extra creamy lather. So many of the stars speak of that. Active lather that goes to work so gently and quickly. Screen stars say they wouldn't miss their daily Lux soap facials for anything. Well, there's no doubt about it. Regular beauty facials with Lux toilet soap really make skin lovelier. In recent tests, actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. And the nice thing is, active lather facials are so easy, so quick. All you do is cover your face with the rich Lux soap lather, lots of it, and work it in thoroughly. You rinse with warm water, splash with cold, then pat with a soft towel to dry. Pretty simple, Sally, considering that's the complexion care that actually makes skin smoother, fresher, more appealing. The complexion care nine out of ten screen stars use. And now, a suggestion to the ladies in our audience. Why not get some gentle white Lux toilet soap tomorrow? Use it every day for a while. Then, look in your mirror. See if you aren't pleased with the softer, lovelier look your skin will have. And now... Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of Tender Comrade, starring Olivia de Havilland as Joe, June Dupre as Barbara, and Dennis O'Keefe as Chris. It's Sunday morning in the headquarters of War Widows Local, number 37, and Joe, Barbara, Doris, and Helen are firmly entrenched in their new home. But the girls like these, welding a seam or driving a rivet is far easier than housekeeping. 
for three futile hours. They've struggled with floor mops and scrubbing brushes. And now on the second floor, Barbara is about to tackle the staircase. But unfortunately, the staircase tackles Barbara. Oh, oh. Look, I'm a commando. Oh, Bob, what a mess. Honestly, haven't any of you ever kept house before? Look, you don't carry a mop sidewise. You carry it lengthwise like a fishing pole, see? I guess I'm just a well-developed half-wit. Oh, why don't we admit it? We've been walk- working for the... For hours, and the place looks just as bad. Housekeeping just isn't our racket. But what can we do? Well, we work eight hours a day as it is. If we have to work another eight hours to keep this dump going, we may as well be back where we were. Well, we signed a lease, and we're stuck with it. No. We need a housekeeper. A housekeeper? Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Here, here. What do you think of the idea, Helen? Judging from what I've seen, it's the only idea. Okay, we'll take a vote. Everybody in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. We get a housekeeper. Somehow. Doorbell. I'll get it. Yes? My name is Mrs. John Canby Lodge. Yes? You advertise for a housekeeper? Oh, yes. Won't you come in? Thank you. In here, please. Before I was married, my name was Manya Wadenheimer. You may call me Manya. All right. I'm Joe, and this is Barbara, Helen, and Doris. Girls, this is Manya. How do you do? Well, um, have you, uh, have you had any experience in this kind of work? I have kept house for my father in Dresden. He had eight little ones. Just gave experience. And, um, uh, references? I am afraid, No. In this country, I'm just beginning to work. Well, um, uh, there are a few, uh... Well, uh, we'd like to know what your salary will be. My salary? <laughs> it is like this. I am not yet a citizen, so I cannot work in divorce land. But you work in divorce land. If I help you, I help divorce just the same. Is that all right? Well, I think it is. Your husbands are in the army fighting against Nazis. So is my husband. That makes us fun. How dare you think of money? Well, uh, perhaps we'd better talk it over first. I wonder if you'd mind oh, waiting course. in. Uh, I'll wait in the other room. Well, gee, after what she said about being done. Why don't we take our cash after the rent and groceries are paid and split it five ways? Well, even that wouldn't be as much as she could make someplace else. Well, I think it's a good idea. Why don't we vote on it? Okay. Everybody in favor says aye. 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 Okay. War Widows Local, number 37, expands its membership to five. Manya! Yo, you're in. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Thomas. Hi, Manya. You're late. But I saved supper. Skip it, I've got a date. That's you, Barbara. We're in here. Coming. Hey, where have you been? Hey, Barbara, your hair. Like it? Stop by to have it done. Mm, you should wear it like that always. You have very small ears. Going out? Yeah. With a man? As far as I know. He'll be here any minute. Who? Oh, you know, that moth-eaten Don Juan who's been pestering me. Well, I don't think you ought to go. Neither do I. For the love of my why not? Well, I just don't think we ought to start having a bunch of old men hanging around the house. What do you mean, old? He's only 42. Go ahead and do what you like. But I should think with Pete out there somewhere on a ship, you might at least try to play square. You leave Pete out of this. He's a no-good, double-crossing woman chasing dope. He hasn't written to me for three months, and as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't have to. In the meantime, if some slap-happy old goat wants to take me out, I'm just the girl to oblige. All the same, you'll be sorry sometime. Why? Well, good golly, if you married the guy, you must have loved him. And the least you can do is be on the level when he's out fighting. Sure, I know you want to go out, but so do I. So it do... just occurred to me that this is none of your business. Let's take a vote on it. All in favor of me taking care of my affairs, say aye. All right. You win. Excuse me, ladies, but I think I forget to tell you I am committing the butcher. Quit, Mr. Johnson, but why? Because he is a black market. Manya! Yes, ma'am. I tell him one pound of bacon because that is all we have stamps for. And when I get home, I have two pounds. Manya, he's probably just trying to be nice to us. Nice to us, yeah. But is it being nice to the other people? Is it being nice to my John, who is in the United States Army fighting Nazis? No. He's not nice. 
Tomorrow I tell him something, believe me. Manya's right, of course. Look, what difference does a pound of bacon make? This joint's getting so moral, we're all afraid to take a deep breath. Man, bacon, gab, gab, gab. Anybody who goes to a black market is a heel, and you know Oh, it. relax. If you want the truth to me, rationing is one beautiful pain in the neck. Barbara, you should be ashamed. You now, should... wait a minute. You girls jumped on me the minute I came in the door. But now I'm telling you something. I've been listening to this kind of gabble for three weeks, and sisters, I'm plenty sick of it. Rationing? Sure, I'll be rationing. I've got to be, but that doesn't say I like it. Who said we like it? Let me finish. We're rationing so a lot of foreigners can have it. And while we get pushed around at home, our guys are out there fighting in places they never even heard of, fighting for a lot of foreigners. Oh, what is the truth and you know it? You, why you, you're talking just like Berlin. Every time you even think those things, you're double-crossing your own husband. Oh, I am, am I? How can we mind our own business when somebody blackjacks us in a dark alley and we've got a Pearl Harbor on our hands? Sure, we make mistakes. You want a country where they won't stand for a mistake? Go to Germany, go to Japan, and the first time you open your mouth like you did just now, you'll find a gun in your face. You're the kind of people Hitler counted on when he started this war, and by Jiminy, as long as you're in this house. All right, honey, that's my date. Saved by the bell. Phew, warm in here, isn't it? I wish I'd slugged it. Oh, hello, Waldo. Come on in. Hiya, baby. I've got to run upstairs, but I'll only be a minute. Oh, this is Helen Stacy, Doris Dombrowski, and in this corner, featherweight Joe Jones. I guess you know them, don't you? Hello. Yeah, this is a little thick, Waldo, with it having what is known as a small beast. Huh. Small beast better than none these days. Ah. Ah. Sit down. The girls are just dying to talk to you. Say, listen, news boys. Sounds like an extra's out. An extra? Wait a second, I'll go and see. Lady X3, all about the Yorktown. Here, here, boy. X3, aircraft carrier Yorktown. Sunk X3, What did you say about the Yorktown? Helen, let me see that paper. Barbara. Uh, the Navy Department has just announced the loss of the aircraft carrier Yorktown. The disaster occurred. All Los Angeles men are reported missing. Lieutenant Junior Grade Howard Christensen of 535 Teller Avenue. Machinist's mate Peter Thomas, whose wife. Pete. Oh, Barbara. Barbara. I'm all right. Well, though, if you don't mind, I guess I won't be going out. Sure, sure. I'll go. If there's anything I can do, I'll... Since I was a kid, I wanted to be an actress. I guess I've been building my whole life for this moment. But I never expected my timing to be so good. Even to an exit up the staircase. Oh, why doesn't somebody... Cut my tongue out. But, gee, Joe, it's not your fault. Joe, where are you going? To my room. Let Barbara alone now. And please let me alone, too. Oh, Chris, Chris. You're not very proud of me right now, are you? Barbara. That poor kid. Why do I have to always shoot off my mouth? And I promised you I wouldn't. I promised. You remember, don't you, Chris? That night, that night we had our first argument. Chris? What are you reading? Hmm? Oh, a magazine. Oh, it's an article. Will the United States enter World War II? You need a shine. Yeah, I know. Hey, what's this? Where? In your hand. Is it a splinter? Mm, I guess so. Wait a minute. I'll get a needle from the basket. Here it is. Now give me your hand. Hmm? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Now hold still and it won't... Ouch! Did it hurt? Well, sure it hurt. It hurt a lot. Oh, you. Always whining. I'm not whining. You asked me a question. Oh, all right. Now, hold still. Hey, wait a minute. Did you sterilize that needle? I might get an infection. An infection. I stuck a nail clear through my foot when I was 12, and I didn't make half as big a fuss. I'm not making a fuss. But when you take a needle that long and jab it halfway through a man's hand, that's no good. You'll scar me up. Scar you up? 
You're a hypochondriac anyway. Well, how do you like that? Just because I don't want to get it stuck like a pig in a slaughterhouse, I'm a hypochondriac. Oh, hold still and let me get the thing out. It isn't going to hurt at all. Oh. There, you see, it didn't hurt at all. <sighs> no, no more than if you chopped my leg off. I wish you'd spend more time sewing buttons on my shirts and less time hacking at my hand. What was that about your shirts? Oh, the shirts are fine. It's the buttons. Well, why didn't you say something about it? I did. Day before yesterday, I said, Joel, my shirts are all getting so they don't have any buttons. Oh, you did. All I did today was scrub the back porch and clean out the basement and take those slips over to Mother's house and get your breakfast and get your lunch and get... Lay off, will you? You sound like I was making a galley slave out of you. All day long, it's just work, work, work. Day in, day out, trying to keep the house neat and clean and trying to keep you fed. And then what happens? The minute you hit the front door, you start yelling something about your shirts. I haven't just hit the front door. I've been home for two hours. I've eaten dinner and I've helped you with the dishes. I was trying to read an article. And you start to slice my hand open. And then I just happened to say something just about... Just happened. You've been building up to this all evening. All right. Go ahead. Think up some more things. All right, I will. My suit isn't back from the cleaners like you promised. My socks are in the top drawer again instead of in the middle drawer where I keep begging you to put them. And my nightshirt is never on the same hook at night as where I put it in the morning. And somebody's been using my razor and you can't tell me it was the pussycat. <laughs> is that all? I can think of plenty more. Including, I suppose, the fact that you never clean out the bathtub when you're through. Ah, there you go. I warned you about that before we were married. I told you I hated cleaning out the tub and I'd never do it. Oh, no, sir. Can't hang that on me because you were told in advance and you said you didn't care. That's because I didn't know you so well. Now I do. All you want is somebody to slave and cook and take care of the laundry and dust the furniture and lay out your clothes and scrub the bathtub and then sit with her hands folded in the evening and watch you read. Joe. Shirts, shirts, shirts. Nothing but an old housekeeper. If he wanted a housekeeper, why didn't he get one? Uh, what are you doing? Sewing the buttons on your darned old shirts. All right, Joe. Let's have it. Have what? Let's have what the trouble is. Come on, if you're sore, I've at least a right to know why. All right. I'm sore because I never get to see you anymore. Well, the nights I haven't been home, I've been working, you know that. Well, haven't you got spunk enough to tell him to get somebody else to put in all that overtime down there? I volunteered for that overtime, Joe. You volunteered? Mm-hmm. Well, now I am getting mad. I volunteered because I'm thinking about you. You're taking on all that overtime because you're thinking of me? Yes. Okay. Why? Well, you heard the news about the British being thrown back to a Dunkirk. Sure, sure, I heard it. So what? So sooner or later we're going to get into the war. That means that, well, I may have to go. And so I want some money saved up so that you'll be okay until I get back. That's why I'm grabbing all that overtime. What do you think I am, Chris Jones? An idiot? I think you're a cute kid. Do you think I'd trade one evening with you for all the money you could possibly make down at that darned old plant? Well, I'm sorry, Joe, but I'm making sure my wife's got enough dough to see her through. Your wife. You talk as if I was a horse and you had to lay in a supply of hay. Well, I'm just old-fashioned enough to think that you... Look, you want money? Okay, I'll go out and get a job and we can just stack it up in the bank. Higher and higher and higher. Until we've got so much, we'll never see each other. Oh, no. There's no reason to fly off the handle. Either you give up this night work and spend your evenings with me, or I'll go out tomorrow and get a job. You'll do nothing of the sort, Joe. I will so, and you can just make up your mind to that right now. Do you mean that? You bet I do. Okay, okay, you win. You mean no more night work? No more. Oh, Chris. I didn't mean to be so ornery. But you make me so darn mad. Don't you see, Chris? I don't want money. I want you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the way I feel, too. Oh, Chris. I'm sorry I hurt your finger, and I'm sorry I get mad so all of a sudden, and I'm sorry. Well, I won't do it again. Hmm? That's a promise. 
I'll count up to 600 or something. I simply will not fly up like that anymore. Okay. Only don't get too perfect. I kind of like you the way you are. Perfect. Don't get too perfect, you said. You'd think I'd have learned my lesson that night, Chris, but I didn't. I fell down on you tonight terribly. Barbara's inside the other room. I can still hear her sobbing. Oh, Chris. I need you. I need you. Something awful. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars will return in Act Two of Tender Comrade. Was there ever a girl in love who didn't sometime or other ask this question? Come on and tell me, Jim. What was it made you fall in love with me? And nine times out of ten, the answer goes something like this. Well, gosh, honey, I don't know exactly. There's something about you, that's all. You're so, so sweet. You see, it's often hard for a man to put into words the way he feels about the girl he loves... But when he says she's sweet, among other things, it's pretty sure to mean that she has the all-important feminine charm that women call daintiness. Men just know it makes a girl nice to be close to. Here's what a famous screen star, Ida Lupino, says. Without perfect daintiness, no other charm counts. And she gives you a tip. It's so easy to make daintiness sure. A daily Luxo beauty bath does the trick. The creamy, fragrant lather leaves skin really fresh, sweet. Yes, charming women everywhere have discovered that their complexion soap, Lux Toilet Soap, makes a delightful bath soap, too. They love the luxury of this satin-smooth cake, the delicate clinging fragrance it leaves on the skin. They love the way it lathers, even in hard water. Yet Lux Toilet Soap is thrifty, too. Each cake can be used to the last thin sliver. So, for a real beauty bath, use the soap that's luxurious, yet inexpensive. The soap nine out of ten screen stars prefer. Hollywood's own beauty soap. Why not get some fragrant white Lux toilet soap tomorrow? Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. We wish you could meet tonight's stars in person, but as the next best thing, we want you to join us after the play for a brief chat. Now, here's Act Three of Tender Comrade, starring Olivia de Havilland as Joe, June Dupre as Barbara, and Dennis O'Keefe as Chris. <laughs> Weeks slipped by, and with Manya managing the household, the membership of War Widows Local, number 37, has settled down to routine. But put five women together, and something's bound to happen. And it does happen one evening, when Joe comes home late, a strange smile on her lips, and her eyes all glimmering. Joe? Yep. Hurry up. Dinner's on. Hey, how can you pick the afternoon off? Look, I think we'd better have a meeting right away. Kids, we got trouble. But, Joe, what's wrong? Well, you remember it was my idea that we take this house in the first place? Yes. And it was I who suggested that we get a housekeeper like Manuel, remember? Joe, what on earth? Well, it looks like I'm going to get more good out of it than any of you because, well, that's why I want you to know that I didn't know until today. For heaven's sake, now what? That I'm going to have a baby. Oh, Oh, Joe, darling. She, that's wonderful. That's simply wonderful. Yeah. I think so, too. Well, Mrs. Jones, how do you feel? Well, I... I guess I'm too dazed to know, Doctor, but I think I feel fine. You should feel fine. You got a fine baby boy. Fine baby. Now, uh, what's the young man's name going to be? Well, I guess the same as his father. Christopher, huh? Christopher Latham Jones, Jr. Oh, uh, what camp is Mr. Jones in now? I don't know. He's overseas, Doctor. Oh, well, uh, he'll have a fine surprise for him when he comes back, won't he? You said it. (laughs) Well, I guess you and your son would like to be alone for a while. 
Oh, Doctor, can we? I mean, can I have them? I don't know who has a better right. Here we are. You can have them for ten minutes. Gosh. Oh, gosh. Just look at you. Your pop's here, too, young fella. Sure he is. See? That's his picture there. Chris, are you glad? Please be glad. Oh, I know. We were going to be so smart, weren't we? Remember that time we talked about babies? I was busy in the living room, and you came barging in, and... What's that you're doing? Oh, practicing. On diapers? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, sir. First things first. And when you're getting ready for babies, that means diapers. Uh, I see. Louise wanted me to get a bathrobe. Imagine. Oh. Oh, Louise knows all about this, too, huh? Oh, everybody knows. But you never got around to telling me because I'm not very important. Well, there's no use getting upset about it. No, no, no. Of course not. No. Because it's none of your business. None of my business. <laughs> Well, if Harvey wanted you to know, I guess he would have told you. Oh, what's Harvey got to do with it? Don't be such a numbskull. It's Harvey's baby. I... Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, Harvey and Jane are going to have a baby. Well, of course. We're going to give Jane a shower, and I got diapers. Oh, well, that's different. Oh, Chris. You didn't think. Yeah. Yeah, that's just exactly what I thought. Oh, Chris. I think that's cute. You were scared. Well, I'm glad. This is no time to have babies. Well, everybody seems to be having them. The Gateses and the Hiltons are... Uh, you're not getting at anything, are you, Joe? Mm-mm. Because if you are, I think we ought to do a little talking about it first. See, Joe, I wouldn't like to leave you alone with the baby. Leave me alone? Well, the draft is going to come calling on me one of these days, and I'd just soon you had nobody to take care of but yourself. Well, they're not going to take married men. It said so in the paper. They're going to have to take married men. You mean you want to go off and get in the army? Well, I don't mean that at all. I just mean that it may be necessary. And that's why when you started talking about babies, I, I got scared. Only if we did have a baby, I wouldn't be so alone when you went. Oh, there'll be time later on, Joe. I've kind of made some plans about that kid of ours. I want him to have the best of everything. The very best from the minute he's born. You do, too. Sure. Be nice if he looked like you, too. Well, having a baby is a pretty important thing. Take you and me. We never went to college. Well, I'm not complaining, but our kid, that's different. If he wants to be a doctor, lawyer, musician or something, I want to be able to back him up. He'll be smart. I hope he's got your brains. Well, then again, I... Well, I, I'd kind of like to be around when he's born. And I'd like to see him when he begins to talk and when he... Well, whatever it is they do first. He'll do everything early. I've just got that feeling. Oh, after the war is over, we'll have the doggondest kid you ever saw. Right now, I don't think it'd be fair to him. Well, I guess you're right, Chris. You're always right. You and I, we're going to be smart about it. We, the Joneses, hereby swear off kids for the duration. Oh, don't be sad, Joe. I love you so much, I seem to be going around all the time in a kind of a pink fog. I'm the luckiest guy on earth. And here he is, Chris, your baby, that post-war genius of ours. He's here, and you, you're heaven knows where. Oh, but he's nice, Chris. What's the matter with you? Yeah, just like your old man, hollering before you're hurt. Well, what did you think of him, Helen? Oh, he's just wonderful. Just wonderful. Yeah, I think so, too. And you're coming home tomorrow. That's wonderful, too. Say, any mail at home? Yeah, just one letter from me. From Arthur? Yes. Fine thing. Everybody gets mail but me. Helen. Hmm? You suppose you could read some of it to me? Why, of course, darling. He says uh, he's so glad we have such a nice place. That my friends are all so wonderful. And then he says, I just received word that our son, our Ted, has been made a major. 
But don't write Ted until he tells you about it first. Somehow, I feel it's our triumph as much as his, and that I have the right to break the news to you first, in secret. Joe, I, I just can't see. May I? The news to you first, in secret. I find myself sitting here thinking of all that has happened to us. And it all centers around you, my darling, and around Ted. And I think that most of all, I remember that for 23 years, with all our blunders, we still have his respect. That's pretty good, isn't it, Helen? I can't wait to see him with gold oak leaves on his shoulders. I'll be so proud to salute him. But in my heart, I'll be saying, my little boy, what I really want is to put my arms around you and hold your head close to me and kiss your cheek. How strange to think he'd resent that, our little son, who used to love it so. Oh, Helen, it's beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. I wonder, will Chris ever feel like Arthur feels now? And will I ever be like you? Oh, I hope so. Oh, I hope so. Come in. I've been waiting for you. You look... Well, Joe. But who cares about you? Where's the baby? The doctor wants him to sleep in Manny's room downstairs till I can get up. Doris and Helen are with him now. I've got a husband. Barbara. Pete's alive, Joe. He's safe. Oh, I'm so happy. He's in the hospital in Honolulu. He's going to be okay. Oh, I'll never be able to tell you how sorry I am for blowing up at you that time. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. I deserved it. I'm just a big no-good dame, but my heart's in the right place. Sure. Gee, I, I always swore I'd never knuckle down to any man. Especially a guy like Pete, always making passes. But if I ever get a guy in my arms again, I'll knuckle down to him. Joe, I'm going to love that man like nobody's ever been loved before. <laughs> Get it. Oh, you'll sit right where you are. You've only been up for a week, so take it easy. Well, okay, Bob. Coming. Hello, Doris. Mike. Oh, Mike. Well, aren't you... Aren't you going to kiss me or anything? Oh, Mike. That's more like it. Uh, can I come in? Who is it? Oh, why didn't you let me know you were coming? I, I can hardly believe my eyes. It's you, Mike. Uh... Those your, your friends? Oh, oh, well, here he is. Well, why don't you say something? Oh, this is my Mike. We had a slight hunch. This is uh, Joe Jones, Helen Stacy, Barbara Thomas. Hello. How do you do? Well, this calls for drink. Except all we got is wine. Well, I, I don't think I care. Well, why don't you uh, take off your coat and make yourself at home? Well, you see, I... I when a plan... man gets home, he likes to take his coat off, and this is your home. You must be hungry. Do you want me to make you some sandwiches? No, thanks. Uh, you see, now, I... take off your shoes and just relax. Here, Mike. Here, take a slug. Gee, I wish it was something stronger. Thanks. I do think you should have some to eat. Hey, we ought to have a fire in the fireplace. Well, some people say it takes a heap of living to make a house a home, but I say it takes a bright fire and a good-looking man. Here, here's a magazine, Mike. Oh, he doesn't want to read. I think he ought to have a nice warm bath. Must want something for a boy. Well, all right. What do you want, Mike? Well, I thought I'd A cigarette? Like... Uh, thank you. Food. You certainly can eat, can't you, Mike? Well, I, I guess so. Manya made some stuffed cabbage. Look. Why don't each of us cook the thing we make best? Doris and Mike will be our guests. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll do abalone steaks. Arthur used to just love them. With stuffed cabbage? Oh, Pete's crazy about baked oysters. He just can't get enough of them. With stuffed cabbage? Don't you think there's a little too much fish? Oh, no. The oysters and the stuffed cabbage will be kind of an old dev and then the abalone steak. Okay. I'll make the dessert. Pumpkin pie with whipped cream. With stuffed cabbage. Well, we'd better hurry. Now, I'll need some mushrooms for the sauce. You certainly hit it right, Mike, just in time for dinner. Oh, boy. How 
they doing in there, Manya? Such an appetite I never saw. Three stuffed cabbages. And he's on his second abalone steak now. I wonder where he puts it all. Well, they ought to be ready for their dessert pretty soon. Those poor boys get such plain food in the army. It's a pleasure to see him. <laughs> I'm going in and watch. Joe, just for a second. I'll only stay a second. Gosh, they're cute. Hi. Well, Mike, if you behave yourself, I'll let you hold my baby for his bottle. He'll be waking up soon. Oh, well, gosh. That'll be swell. Well, I don't let everybody... Ho- hey. What goes? Oh, the fireplace. Oh, gosh. It's full of fish. The fireplace is full of abalone. Oh, Mike, you poor kid. You don't like fish, do you? Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. I I didn't know where to put it, and I I just put it in the fireplace. Oh, Joe, it's been just terrible. Fish makes him sick. He doubles up and gets the bin. Stuffed cabbage, too. Now, don't think a thing about it. If we hadn't been such darn fools, we'd have asked him what he liked in the first place. You see, Mike, you're in a kind of funny spot. Tonight, we all got the idea you're our husband, and we've been cooking the things our husbands like. Oh, that's okay. Only I guess I'd better clean out the fireplace. Look, I've got pumpkin pie with whipped cream for dessert. Now, do you like it? Now, tell the truth. I'd love it. Good. Coming! Now, look, kids. I'll clear these things off and nobody will know about it, and I'll serve the dessert right away. Then I'll make some sandwiches later on and stack them in the icebox for you, okay? Oh, Joe, I'm so glad you understand. But first, I'd better get that door. Yes? Telegram for Mrs. Christopher Jones. That's me. Sign here, ma'am. Thank you. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your husband, Staff Sergeant Christopher Latham Jones, was killed in action on the 12th of May, 1943, in the South Pacific. Joe! Joe! Who was it? Nothing, Doris. Nothing. Where are you going? Just upstairs for a minute. I I thought I heard baby. Baby. Please wake up. I've got to talk to somebody. I can't talk to them downstairs. They're having a party. Besides, this is private. Just between you and me. Why can't I cry? I want to cry and I can't. I kind of made some plans for that kid of ours, Joe. I want him to have the best of everything. The very best. The minute he's born. Yes, he said that. Your father. The man in this picture. Nana went out and died so you could have a better break than he had. Remember him as long as you live. He didn't leave you any money. He didn't have time to. He only left you the best world a little boy could ever grow up in. He bought that for you with his life. So as long as you live, don't ever let anybody say that he died for nothing. To be free to live with you. Enough food, our own home. died for something wonderful. And if you ever betray it, or if you ever let anybody talk you out of it, or fight you out of it, you may as well be dead too. So hang on to it, little Chris. Grab it right out of your father's hands and hold it tight forever. Hold it high and proud. Well, back to sleep to you, baby. Back to bed. I've got to go downstairs now. And you, Big Chris. Don't worry, darling. We'll come through all right. We'll come through. Teacher, tender comrade, wife. A full affair, true through life, heart whole and soul free, the august father gave to me. (laughs) 
Once again, it's curtain call time. And we invite to the footlights our trio of stars. Olivia de Havilland, June Dupre, and Dennis O'Keefe. With our thanks for, uh, for an excellent performance. I might add that this is Olivia's first appearance on the air after visiting our soldiers for seven weeks in the South Pacific. So you're a tender comrade in real life, Olivia. Well, the payoff is I had to go and catch pneumonia, and the soldiers ended up by visiting me. (laughs) You know, uh, this is the first appearance of June Dupre in our theater, and a very welcome one. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Did I do all right? All right. You were perfect, June. You know, you were pretty good yourself, C.B., well, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Well, uh, perhaps you were a little nervous, but it takes time to get your confidence in. I have a personal cure for nervousness, CB. Lux toilet soap. Lux toilet soap? How do you figure that out, Olivia? Well, a girl just naturally has more poise and self-assurance when she looks her best. I know I do. I agree with Olivia. I know I couldn't be without Lux toilet soap. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> You use Lux Toilet Soap, Dennis? Mm Mm-hmm. Every Saturday night. (laughs) Well, Dennis, you've certainly traveled far in pictures since the first time you worked for me. Oh, that's the DeMille touch, C.B. In fact, it's more than a touch. It's a very generous boost. What are you boosting on Lux next week, C.B.? Oh, we have another, another exciting treat next Monday night, Olivia. It's the Paramount smash hit, Lady in the Dark. Starring Ginger Rogers and Ray Milland in their original role. Lady in the Dark was one of Broadway's great successes. And Hollywood made it one of the screen's most entertaining and sophisticated comedies. About a glamorous girl who couldn't make up her mind between success and love. You ought to pack the house, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Tender dreams for tender comrades. This week, we received a very pleasant notice from Radio Daily, saying that in a poll of radio editors, the Lux Radio Theater was voted America's Outstanding Dramatic Program for 1944. We we thank you and we, we thank the editors who participated in this poll and promise that we'll do our best to continue to be worthy of this honor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ginger Rogers and Raymond Land in Lady in the Dark. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week on Friday, January 26th, we salute the public health nurses, that loyal, hard-working band of women who are helping protect our national health throughout these critical war years. Housewives, too, can help America at war by saving all waste kitchen fats and greases. Strain them into a clean can and rush them to your butcher. In return, he'll give you two red ration points plus four cents for each pound. Tender Comrade, from an original screenplay by Dalton Trumbo, was presented through the courtesy of RKO, producers of Experiment Perilous. Olivia de Havilland will soon be seen starring in the Paramount production, The Well-Groomed Bride. June Dupre is currently appearing in RKO's None But the Lonely Heart. Dennis O'Keefe will shortly be seen in Hal Wallace production, The Affairs of Susan. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Lady in the Dark with Ginger Rogers and Ray Milan. 24 points for butter? Oh, whatever will I do? Use Creamy Spry for cakes and pies. It takes only two. Yes, ma'am, Spry's still the buy. Use Pure Spry Shortening for all baking and frying. Use it, too, instead of butter for white sauce and for vegetables. Spry helps solve your ration problem. Gives you more delicious foods. Tomorrow, get Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Lady in the Dark with Ginger Rogers and Ray Milland. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>